the Hippocratic Oath in Halakha. Introduction Hippocrates often considered the father of Western medicine lived in ancient Greece shortly after the building of the Second Temple. Despite his numerous contributions to academic and clinical medicine, Hippocrates is likely best known to modern students of medicine through the Hippocratic Oath, a text attributed to Hippocrates and traditionally administered to students shortly before their graduation from medical school. Before addressing Halakha considerations related to this practice, we note that taking this oath, a tradition followed in the vast majority of medical schools in the United States, is in no way required to be either licensed or as a physician, nor to be board certified. Thus, the practical interest in taking this oath is less a question of professional necessity and more a question of tradition, one in which many would like to participate. The Oath The substance of the Hippocratic Oath is largely innocuous. The starting physician pledges to respect his or her teachers and to teach the art of medicine to other worthy students. He or she commits to heal patients, respect their privacy, neither harm nor take advantage of them or their families, nor to assist them in suicides or abortions. Finally, the physician agrees to abstain from performing surgeries, which should be left to trained surgeons. Although wording of the oath varies today from school to school, these themes, derived from the oldest extinct copies of the text, are shared by most modern versions. No individual part of this oath appears particularly problematic from a Halakha point of view. Indeed, many of its themes seem entirely consistent with, if not identical to, traditional Jewish values. However, recitation of the Hippocratic Oath still raises several Halakha issues related to Shivua, an oath in Jewish law. Obligations of Shivua. The Torah gives us the ability to obligate ourselves in or prohibit ourselves from otherwise permissible behavior. If a man makes a vow to God or makes an oath to prohibit himself, he shall not violate his word. According to whatever came out of his mouth, he shall do. Be Midbar 30, verse 3. Such a vow is known in rabbinic literature as a shivat bitua, literally a vow of expression. That's S-H-E-V-U-A-T-B-I-T-U-I. Will in violation of shivua can be punished with lashes. In at her Inadvertent violation results in the obligation to bring a sacrifice. The Ram Bam counts both a positive commandment to fulfill one's commitments and also a prohibition of swearing falsely. False Gods The original text of the Hippocratic Oath invokes the names of several Greek gods, including Apollo, Hagia, and Panacea. That's capital A-P-O-L-L-O, capital H-Y-G-I-E-I-A, Hagia, and Panacea, capital P-A-N-A-C-E-A. Swearing in the name of pagan gods almost certainly violates the biblical prohibition of 
Vashem Elohim Asherim Lo Tisakaro Swearing in the name of false gods. The original text of the oath is thus clearly problematic and may not be recited under any circumstances. In contemporary times, however, various modified versions of the text are used and hardly any graduated medical student is asked to invoke the names of ancient pagan gods. We are then left to contend with several more broadly applicable questions surrounding oaths. Are oaths in general permissible and advisable? Is the Hippocratic Oath recognized as Halakha, as a Shivoa? What should happen if the Shivoa leaves one conflicted between his or her commitment to fulfill the Shivoa and other responsibilities? Halakhic or otherwise. In advisability of Shivio, in concluding his discussion of the laws of Shivio, the Rambam summarizes the accepted rabbinic attitude towards taking unnecessary oaths. It is a great good for a person to not swear at all. Although in limited circumstances, taking an oath is permitted or even obligatory. Those, are cases, those cases are generally viewed as exceptions. Many understand this discouraging attitude as stemming from a blanket fear that the oath may be violated even if inadvertently. The Talmud thus relates a story in which inadvertent violation of a shivua appears to be punished by heaven with the death of a child, further highlighting the severity with which the Halakha treats this topic. Rambam, that's capital R-A-M-B-A-M, counts the violation of a shivua among the most severe of sins, the only non-capital crime described in such terms. Given the ease with which commitments are often made and broken, it seems only wise to distance oneself from Shivuot and their punishments as much as possible. Other sources suggest a secondary concern, independent of any fear that a Shivuot might eventually be violated. In a chapter detailing some Halakha of pursuing a profession, the Tur, the T U R writes that one should be very careful of swearing, even truthfully, and cites a story from the Midrash in which thousands of cities were destroyed as punishment for an unnecessary truthful she wore. Even if prudence would dictate distancing ourselves from the mere possibility of swearing falsely, disregard for that caution is unlikely to itself be grounds for such severe punishment. Instead, it seems swearing in God's name when doing so is not absolutely necessary, is itself dishonorable and offensive. In a sense, it is a particularly egregious example of taking God's name in vain. Status as Shavua. Of course, the germ. Inadvisability of taking a shivua is not particularly relevant if the case before us is not first established as a bona fide shivua. Indeed, a reader may wonder whether the Hippocratic Oath is recognized by Halakha as a shivua, given that this pronouncement is often made in English without the wording of an oath and even without the name of God. Moreover, in some cases, the oath is not made directly, and instead, graduating students respond, Amen, after the oath is recited by a person leading the commencement ceremony. In accordance with an opinion of the Rashba, the Rima states that there is no difference between a Shavua stated in Hebrew and one stated in any another language. Even use of the word shivua is unnecessary, and a synonym is sufficient. Moreover, while early 
commentator debate whether a shavua made without explicit reverence to God is punishment punishable when violated. All agree that such a shivua still entails all prohibitions associated with a shivua. Finally, the Talmud makes clear that a shivua need not be recited directly, but can also be made by responding affirmatively to the administering of a shivua by another person. Early authorities elaborate that this is true even if the person administering the oath is not Jewish. Moreover, this is true even if the person responding did not use the exact word amen, but instead used any syn synonymous phrase. The above halakha, largely uncontested by earlier or later authorities, indicate that under normal circumstances, recitation of the Hippocratic Oath would entail the full halakha obligations of the Shavua. Instead, in discussion related to the Hippocratic Oath, several contemporary authorities have taken for granted its status as a proper shivua. Although we have previously noted the inadvisability of taking oaths generally, the halakha of shivua are worth considering, as they may relate to cases in which a shivua has already been made perhaps inadvertently or without full understanding of, of its halakha implications. Intention. For a shivua to be binding, it must involve both purposeful intent and an explicit expression of that intent. The typical graduating student between listening to speeches and other parts of the commencement program might by rote read the Hippocratic Oath with his or her classmates without sufficient intention to make this a binding oath. This may leave room for leniency in some cases in which the oath was already taken. Moreover, even when there is no question that the shivua was in fact made, the particular intention of the person making it must still be considered. When one commits to not harm patients, for example, he or she does not mean that they will not prescribe bitter taste in medicines, although in some sense this can be construed as harming patients, harming of patients. This was clearly not the intention of one who took this oath. Early authorities, based on statements in the Talmud, have codified a general principle that we follow the vernacular and intention of a speaker when interpreting Shivoa. This principle must be taken into consideration when establishing what behaviors were and were not included in a particular shivua, shivua concerning mitzvah. The Talmud teaches that an oath made to fulfill or violate a mitzvah is not binding. If one swore, for example, to not eat matzah on the first night of Pesach, or else to withhold testimony in court, such a shivua would not be binding. However, the Talmud also cites an important exception to this principle. If one swore in a general manner, grouping together the performance of a mitzvah with other elective behavior, then such a shivua would be binding even on the mitzvah. For example, if one swore to not eat matzah all year long, then one would be prohibited from eating matzah all year long, even on Pesach itself. Eating matzah at the Seder would then be punishable as would violation of any other shivua. The halakha is relevant in our case as certain obligations imposed by the Hippocratic Oath may eventually come into conflict with other obligations. For example, a physician may be asked to testify in court regarding the condition of patient to help ensure the safety of that patient or others. While providing such testimony may fulfill a biblical obligation of providing testimony, it does so at the expense of violating patient confidentiality. For a physician who has taken the Hippocratic Oath, disclosing confidential information would constitute a violation of a shivua. Uh, the reader shivua. The reader can certainly imagine other situations of potential conflict. Several contemporary authorities have considered practical questions that have arisen in this context. 
Rare Shlomo Gorin addressed a question from a neurologist who had diagnosed a patient with epilepsy and was concerned that the patient may continue to drive despite considerable dangers. The neurologist asked Ram Gorin whether he was permitted or perhaps even obligated to divulge the information he knew to approach authorities. R. Gorin advised the questioner to counsel his patient directly about the legal and halakhic prohibitions involved in driving, and barring any evidence indicating the contrary, the physician could presume that the patient would follow his advice. In such a situation, the physician would be forbidden from violating both the civil law regulating confidential medical information as well, well as the Hippocratic oath he had taken. Only in cases in which the patient adamantly refuses to cease driving and in which the physician believed that continued driving poses risk to the patient or others. Did Ara Gorham recommend approaching a belt den to help annul his vow? Rabbi Lisa Waldenberg discussed a similar case in which a physician had taken the Hippocratic Oath and was subsequently asked to testify in court regarding a patient. Because the Shavua was taken in a general manner, we would expect that the oath also prohibits the physician from providing testimony in court despite it being a mitzvah. However, R. Waldenberg suggested that a physician, and certainly a religious one, does not have in mind when taking this oath to withhold testimony, where doing so would violate a mitzvah. For this reason, he ruled that the physician may testify in court. This conclusion, a tremendous leniency appears at odds with another except the halakha. In particular, the Talmud itself provides an example discussed above of a person who swears not to eat matzah throughout the year and concludes that he is forbidden from eating on Pesach as well. Neither the Talmud nor later authority suggest that the Shavuot be binding only during the year, but that an exception be made for Pesach as a religious person would not have had in mind to prohibit himself from fulfill a mitzvah. Instead, it appears that the simple understanding is that people do not always think carefully about potential repercussions of their verbal commitments. Given that many beginning physicians are likely not thinking about complex eventualities and halakha repercussions of taking the Hippocratic Oath, it seems difficult to justify R. Waldenberg's retroactive understanding of intention at least in our case. Two points might be noted in analyzing the discussions of R. Gorham and R. Wallenberg. First, both tacitly assume that the Hippocratic Oath is recognized by Halakha as a bona fide shavua. Second, neither offered a general advisory against recitation of the Hippocratic Oath, and instead consider how to deal with this potential Halakha ramifications. It is possible that both overestimated the importance of taking this oath and had either known that there is, in fact, no legal nor professional responsibility to do so. They would have advised against his recitation, at least in its classical form, as a shavua. Annulment. The Torah provides a number of mechanisms through which a shavua can be invalidated or annulled. A person who regrets having made a shavua and for whom the shavua creates suffering can approach a group of three people, at least one of whom is familiar with the holocaust of shavua. The petitioner explains the shavua that has been made and explains that had he or she fully understood the consequences of shavua, he or she would never have taken the shavua in the first place. The three people 
then confirm with the person that this is indeed the case, after which they can verbally annul the oath. Like the taking of Sherrod, the annulment has also been traditionally approached with trepidation. The Rambam writes, We do not annul oaths except for a matter of mitzvah or for extenuating circumstances. For this reason, and given the intricacy of the laws of the annulment of Shavuot, even a brief summary of all pertinent laws is not possible in this space. A person finding oneself in such a situation is encouraged to speak with a competent Holocaust advisor familiar with these Holocaust. The importance of fulfilling one's duties as a physician in the most desirable fashion appears to be constitute appears to constitute extenuating circumstances, if not an outright misfire, which may be sufficient grounds for annulment. Conclusions Given the general holocaust reluctance to engage in Shavuot, and given the lack of professional need to take the Hippocratic Oath, it appears that the responsible choice for an observant student would be to abstain from taking this Shavuot. Shavua. Those desiring to participate in this part of the commencement ceremony must consider offering the text they recite in such a way that makes clear that they are not making a Shavua. Nonetheless, it appears that recitation of the Hippocratic Oath, certainly when done so with full awareness of what is being said, creates a binding Shavua in the full Holocaust sense. Despite tension created with other mitzvah, each part of the shvua, shvua is binding because the statements are made in a general manner and are not made to specifically prevent one from performing a mitzvah. Therefore, one who has taken the Hippocratic Oath must exercise extreme caution in situations in which the plain meaning of what one stated entails particular behavior. This is true even when Holocaust obligations resulting from the Shavua come into dissonance with particular misfortune. Great care should be taken in particular in the area of patient privacy. Regardless of whether or not one makes a verbal declaration such as the Hippocratic Oath, many of the obligations described therein should be intimately felt by the religious physician as he or she begins the sacred mission of healing others. In such work, one plays a small role alongside the Almighty, as it were, in fulfilling a Hashem Rofika, I am God, your healer. This is a mission to which, in some sense, the graduating student has since long ago been perpetually sworn from Mount Sinai.